Hello, good afternoon. My name is Anna Morgan Thomas. I am a lecturer in digital marketing in business school. And I would like to share with you some experiences of the courses we've created as a part of the Bolt Initiative. By we, I mean myself and Dr. Dudau here taking my photograph um, and, uh, and uh, our good colleague, George Komenitz. The longer I hear various presenters uh, today, the more I realize that, uh, that I, as digital marketeer, take a slightly different, slightly, it's understatement, I take a completely different approach to designing online courses and thinking about them and talking about them. That is, I make certain assumptions. I think students are people, and I think students behave like most people when behaving online. And they behave in the context of online resources like they behave in other online contexts. So, so I very much take a, a user perspective and I take into account how they feel uh, about and around a course. Uh, if you think uh, what the title is about, I will tell you this presentation is about cheap, cheap, cheap and cheerful tricks for driving satisfaction. Uh, why I say that is because we've created courses that s are very highly rated. And the course that I'm referring to in particular is a postgraduate course in research methods that has rated as 100% satisfaction. And I will show you in a minute that it's not just that they tick, that they tick those boxes. They are very appreciative and happy about this course. And we've raked our heads as to why this is happening. In a way, we are victims of our own success. They are happy, but we cannot quite understand why. So we have conducted very in-depth interviews with about 24 of our participants trying to discern this. We were lucky to have support of Bolt to start this development of those online materials. And for us, the courses are aimed at postgraduate audience. We have a scalability problem. That is, some of our courses are quite bijou, which in a context of business school is about 20 students. And some of them are medium, which in the context of business school is about 450. So we were trying to develop a format that is scalable and that will, that will um, facilitate teaching of, of cohorts of various sizes. In this specific context of MRES and PGR training, we have those three additional pro problems, which are diversity, complexity, and perishability. Diversity, when it comes to blending, we blend away quite uh, extensively. We have MRES students that are mixed with first year PhD students. We have students who are full-time and part-time, and amongst the part-timers, we have students who are located at a distance and uh, students who are located at home. Research methods for stu students preparing for PhDs is a complex, boring, uh, and immense area that is really quite difficult to maneuver. Um, and there is an issue of perishability, that is, when we teach those courses, typically somewhere at the front of the MRES or at the front of the PhD, the students don't necessarily find them that useful because they need them at the back of the project. For an MRES student, this is in the summer period. For a PhD student, it might be three or four, time, four years later when they start writing about this. So perishability is, is an issue. And this issue of diversity, it's not only about full-timers and part-timers, but our st we have students who have kids, mm -hmm. we have students who have career responsibilities and lives in general that are not very conducive of coming to classes at particular time of the week. So we came out with this solution and stuffed a lot of our teaching materials online. I refer to it as a spook because we let uh, aside of other uh, of our students, we let others in from from all over Scotland, and the outcome is uh, has been have been fantastic. Here are some of the comments that that we have received. They do not come from the same student. Uh, in fact, there are <laughs> five different people here. So, so um, gratitude, enjoyment, pleasure, uh, playfulness. They found it interesting. You would not believe, but students comment how research philosophy 
is interesting. Now, if you know anything about research methods, then research philosophy is the single most boring <laughs> aspect of the course, yet they found it entertaining. So we started thinking about it and, and we thought we should stop thinking satisfaction. Satisfaction is a waste product, just like coconut flakes is a product of waste product of something much more important. And we think that this much more important thing is engagement. How students feel, act, and think uh, around the course. So this engagement, we thought, has three dimensions. Well, we didn't think that. Somebody else did. Uh, but we kind of agreed with Fredericks that it has three dimensions. And in, in an online context, that last point is particularly true, that in online context, the engagement has been equalized with interactions. And we heard this today. How did you make your students participate? Did you use forum? Did they reply? Have th were, were there chat opportunities? And so on and so forth. It's a, it's a common wisdom of online uh, learning that interaction equals engagement. I reject that absolutely and completely. Um, the other issue, and I'll show you why, and you will agree with me after the <laughs> end of this <laughs> presentation. Um, the other thing about engagement in e-learning is that there's been quite, quite an emphasis on technology and affordances of technology. So we have particular tools for online learning, and those tools allow us to do some things. So we saw today MOOCs enables us to organize courses. It enables us to get students to rate one another, to carry on assessment, and so on and so forth. So these are the two themes of engagement in e-learning. Now, what is less talk about, or almost not talk about in e-learning, is the question of aesthetics. If you think more broadly about engagement and consider feelings in particular and thinking to an extent, then you have to take into account that online students equals people, online learners, people online equals this emotional encounter that is going on, experiential emotional encounters that involve sensory outcomes. And those encounters are about sensation, feeling something, but also about judgment, making, passing verdict on what you are doing. And, and there is an interplay between the two. Emotions, engagement, cognitive load go together to create better or less uh, students' experience and in the process satisfaction. How did I get to that? We started off trying to prevent the students from hating the courses. So we tried to, we tried to from a very kind of low point, we tried to make them not hate us. And, and the initial assumption was that if they feel comfortable in a space, if it, if it's attractive, if it looks pleasant, if it looks welcoming, and if it makes sense at the first glance, then we will have this kind of head on your left, which is students, no, on the right. Students' attention is, think they are thinking about learning and they are thinking that things are nice and I'm comfortable, and they don't waste time wondering what Moodle is and what are they doing in this space. So the question of designing an interface in such a way as it stimulates learning rather than prevents it was our key thinking. Why? Because if they, if it's that, then at best they don't care, at worst they hate. And if you want to, them to love it, then you have to help them interact with it. And let me show you, this is one of the, a, a, a small extract from our, one of our interviews where a distant student is commenting on their experience with research methods course. We just asked them, you know, how did you feel? How, what did you think about it? And they started going into this uh, rant. And amongst other things, um, they were trying to explain to us why they like this course more than others. So let me see if I can play it. Oh. Hmm. You know, I really like the way how this was done here because if you compare it to a regular, um, if you compare it to a regular Moodle page, uh, I still have some entrepreneurial finance, for instance. This was a Moodle page from last year. Uh, um, you only have three sections, 
assessment, mm -hmm. okay, if you if you first of all see the assessment section, oh my god, I think like, okay, Moodle actually for, for me is, some, is a learning platform, and yes, of course, there's an assessment, but it's the first thing that pops up here, so I haven't even learned anything on Moodle, but it's, for me, this seems like only a submission software, oh my god, without any pictures, it's, ah, you know, uh, very unemotional. And then there's lecture materials, but then look at this. Um, it's lecture materials with with the code in front of it. Of course, okay, now you can make sense of it. E F S M A L lecture, entrepreneurial finance for semi semi uh, for uh, S M E. I don't know. Okay, whatever. But you don't know what the lecture is about. You have no clue what's in there, what the content is, and. Um, now you have to click on it, you have to download, and again you have a boring presentation and you don't really know what the lecturer said during the presentation. And this is something that is completely different in Anna Morgan's research, research methods course where she's... She's wonderful, that's how it goes on. <laughs> uh, but, and let me now prove it to you. So, so this is what we actually have done. Uh, this is this is the the research methods course, and we and we used the grid uh, display method. It's the same course as everybody else, uh, any other course. It's just with one click. Instead of having a long list of topics, we used the grid, um, and the grid sends tells students what the content is. So you have some pre-session work and orientation, but then you have the various topics that the the course covers. And if you go to a topic, then you have videos, uh, a little bit of text that orients them, and then we have those, uh, we, we've used icons uh, throughout that are consistent to let them know what's going on. And, you know, there are exercises and various other things. Now, I, I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation that this was a high production value course. What I mean by that is that we spent horrendous amount of time on uh, thinking about completely unnecessary things like what sign should mark exercise or what size should be the window, um, whether we should or should not have text for each vid video we post. But uh, you've seen it, uh, you know now. The we started at this change point of designing this, i.e. my key problem was that the video should be five minutes long plus minus one minute. When I say high production value, I mean the videos, we used sc uh, scripts throughout and the scripts are now deposited below the videos. And the reason I used scripts because is, was because if you have a script, you are shorter. You don't use air time for, for pauses, you don't repeat yourself, and you convey information in a very concise manner. Students love it. <laughs> Students love to get it in three minutes. It's one of the features that they've commented most ab about. How the videos give them the skeleton and, get, uh, and are short, so you can watch quite a few of them in a short space of time. From the five minutes video, then there, there comes the whole structure of the course. Because if you think about your lecture as being chunks of information, those videos actually organize the rest of the content. What I'm showing you today is, uh, is the results of our evaluations, which, um, which are based on 24 interviews and some Moodle analytics of students doing the course over two years. In total, we had some 60 participants over four, three different PGR courses, P M M M MRS PGR courses. Um, and I'm focusing today on qualitative evidence, just what they said in those interviews. So I will tell you what Moodle does and what Moodle does well. Moodle organizes things for students in a structured way. If you pay attention to it, if you show them what this module is about, they will be really appreciative of it. So, uh, so, so, we, had, so we had a lot of comments about the, the variety of resources, the richness of resources, the fact that we, can, we let them do whatever they wanted so they could watch the videos and some loved it. Others like the script, like me, I think people speak too slow on videos and they bore me to tears. And if you present me with what's, what was the thing that, that they used storyline, 
I, you know, did you do the diversity course at Glasgow? I was about to kill somebody because <laughs> it is delivered at this pace, very clear, and I really don't have time for it. Um, so, so this, this rich and diverse learning resource, this is what Moodle does really well, structures it, makes it, they make sense of it immediately, cognitively, as, as well as emotionally. The other thing Moodle does very well is to address perishability, i.e. those things stay there. And if we work on it, they can stay there for a while. And, and, they, and they stay for this immediate moment where they come in and out of the course. So, you know, I wanted to do it at night. I wanted to do it out of the office. Or this week I had some more time so I could, I could access it. But they also appreciate the fact that, that there's going to be a future uh, perpetuity of this. They, it's, it's, it's comfortable to think, it's secure to think that I will have access to those resources in, uh, in the future. And the third thing, I'm not sure how to, I'm, I'm not sure whether empowerment is a good word, but we talk about flexibility, ac accessibility, um, this kind of convenient utility for students. What, from the comments of my students, I feel that the access to those resources and our input in structuring it for them and helping it make sense hugely empowers, gives them confidence, self-regulates their learning and generates gratitude towards us as instructors that we made the effort, that, that you know, we thought about them. Um, and that's part of the reason why, why the satisfaction is so high. So three things that Moodle does. Uh, what should we be doing as lecturers, instructors? We should be paying attention to aesthetics. These objects, learning objects, are visual artifacts. They trigger emotion, they trigger cognition through their visual impact. Why don't we spend some time thinking and implementing uh, aesthetic designs and it's, it's the, these are really simple things. I mean, there are a few photos um, and a one-click different display of the course. This is not resource-consuming uh, endeavor or endeavor requiring much thinking. More so, if we got together as an institution, we could create ourselves templates that we could all use interchangeably, um, which would be helpful, I think. That, that aesthetic design strong send strong quality signals at, you know, about the place you are in, please have in mind that they can cast their eyes on million godzillion online pages. And some of those pages are free educational pages to which they have access. We compete with MOOCs and we have to look as if we were reputable players of this educational game. Aesthetic plays a big part of this. It sends institutional reputational signals, but also personal reputational signals. Anna is really knowledgeable about research methods. Well, I'm, you know, I'm not sure uh, this is actually factually true, but, but <laughs> it looks as if I am, right? Because, I, it, because it's confidently organized, as if I was. Second issue, this question of structuring. Moodle is really great at it. And looking at the latest updates, I think it's going to be even better uh, it, in, in being able to organize diverse sets of resources and present them in a, a competent and structured and, a, um, and uh, attractive manner. So why don't we make more of this Moodle affordance by, by just putting some thinking behind structuring of learning? And um, I feel I am against interactivity. <laughs> I am against communities of learning. I see no, wait, my students don't interact on Moodle. My students have WhatsApp. My students have Facebook groups. And is there really much point if me trying to make an effort and get them to do something that they would not naturally do on Moodle, where they have all those other opportunities for interactions and whatever, whatever else they, they, they wish to do. Um, and I, 
And I don't like people telling me how I should learn. So I extend the same courtesy to my students. I allow them complete freedom in how or even whether they access those resources. The net result is twofold. Um, students, the, the ones who are not engaged, and we have students that you know, looked at it twice and decided that it wasn't for them, are neutral in the outlook. The most they do is to say, oh, well, you know, I, I was busy. Uh, I had other things to do. But what they don't do is say, I hate it. When you force them, you will get, I hate it. I really dislike this. I, you know, it was not for me and I was forced and I dislike that. So um, I think autonomy is something we should care for and foster as higher educational institution. Um, so to conclude, I think that the structure, structuring of learning against the experiential and what is the other, other name? Um, um, discovering modes of learning, um, constructive modes of learning. I think that structure helps people <laughs> and that it doesn't denote centeredness, learn, uh, uh, teacher alert, delivery mode, but instead promotes confidence, promotes self-inquiry, promotes independence. I think aesthetics really matter and we should put pay more attention to it. And most importantly, Moodle is a tool that is good for certain things. Displaying varied content is what Moodle is really good at. It's not good for other things. Discussions, chats, interactions, users generating content or users creating their own resources. Moodle is rubbish at. So can we please not pervert it and try to force it into things that it doesn't do and make most of the things that it does very well? In terms of going back to the script, just briefly, I, I was giving the script. So what did we like here? Um, what did we do? I, I thought we did a very good job at pleasing uh, some students and I'm really pleased with that. Um, we were supported as a part of the BOLD team, with, with, we were within Adam Business, Business School, so we didn't have uh, the medical faculty level of support. We did have Vicky and we did have John and we did have some technology and, and expertise at hand. The problems, um, control was, was an issue for us, so at various, various times of the delivery we couldn't quite resolve or control uh, various problems such as uh, GTA recruitment, for example, uh, was, a, was a big issue for us. Support, we loved the guys and they were very supportive, but at times it felt it Moodle causes, you know that, various glitches and at times it just felt a bit far. It would have been nice to have, again, the MVLS arrangement where you have somebody near you, a departmental level person you can turn up, uh, turn to uh, at any point. Power, um, God knows who owns those courses. Um, and the latest part of the, so, so we, have, we have the Boodle bo Bold Board paying for it. We have, and, and providing uh, management, but we have our own subject and our own school uh, controlling QA aspects and, and PIP forms and, and knowing nothing about bold board uh, and you're contravening what, what uh, the advice is. And um, the latest of the, of the debacles over, over these courses is that uh, because the course forms a part of research methods training for postgraduates, I had a big fight on my hand last, uh, last autumn where graduate school, my graduate school decided they had a better offer and I should just forget about this course, dismantle it completely. Um, so th this, how, we, how we control those courses, how we develop and manage them is, is an issue for me. I think we should pay more attention to interchangeable learning objects, uh, reusing them and creating shared ones. And I think we should look, invest in localized, localized support for online activities. A couple of final issues. Um, there is a, 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 um, a question of branding versus teaching. So some of the initiatives 
like the PowerPoint, uh, <laughs> that, that are trying to standardize um, consumer experience of this university, seem to run counter the learner experiences and best teaching methods. So in my head, I'm thinking, is it good to have the same gray PowerPoint template on every course any student encounters at this university? Or is it better to separate branding from learning and within learning allow for creativity and allow for differentiation? After all, they already bought the product. Yeah? You know, you don't have to be selling it to them anymore. And, and the question of getting it right, if we think aesthetics and doing aesthetics properly, then somehow as an institution we are not, we are not that great. And I'll show you something. Uh, the, these are two images of uh, my head of subject. I pulled it because I like the photos. Yes, I'm finishing. Uh, and, the <laughs> and the photos, uh, this is the first photo. This is a photo of the man that came with him to the university. A attractive, you know, uh, interesting um, male face, right? If you look at this face, you think, hmm, that's an uh, interesting, intriguing image. This is, this is done outside of this university. This is done at this university. Uh, so can we, can we do something to just to improve our game? Um, I, don't know, I don't know what we should, but, but I, you know, I, I see a difference. I'm not sure whether you share it with me. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for your time. Um,